Welcome back, Well2 family. Once again, Rosendo Rodriguez. We are here today at Republic Testing Labs. For today's video, I have a special guest. His name is Scott Witkowski. Scott here, he's gonna show us the difference between a 70S2 TIG wire, copper coated and non copper coated. So you don't wanna miss it. Stand by. Howdy, y'all. I'm Scott Witkowski. I'm with Republic Testing Laboratories and Gas and Supply. And uh, I'd like to shout out to Resendo for introducing me today. We're going to be doing a little uh, mystery welding type situation, trying to debunk what the difference is between ER70S2 copper coated filler metal and non copper coated filler metal. There's a lot of uh, things out there right now. A lot of welders are out there saying that, you know, they have to have specific wires to be successful. And we're here to basically prove it wrong or prove it right. In our discussion today, prior to doing any welding, I wanted to kind of go over some of the historical facts of the 70S2 wire. It was originally designed to have triple deoxidizers in it, which is enhanced with titanium, zirconium, and um, aluminum, which increases the weld stability of the puddle on dirty or rusty steels. So. Resendo's got two types of wire here. One is a coated 70S2, which is what we've seen since we were sparkle babies. And then this is what we see today a lot now is the copper coated, uncopper coated filler metal. Um, the only difference between the two is one has a copper coating and one does not. The difference between 70S2 copper coated and non-coated filler metal is just the coating. From a chemical perspective, the AWS classifications and the specifications, the manufacturers have to make the filler metal identical. It's, it's what God made it. What we're gonna be doing today is, is I'm gonna weld on this first plate here we've got tacked up and fit together with a pass already in it. We're gonna be welding with the copper coated wire to show the difference between the copper coated filler metal and the non copper coated filler metal. And what I'm seeing right now in the puddle is very little trash in the puddle. I did a good job to make sure my joint was prepped properly and as I weld with this wire and I consume the wire and it wets into the sidewall, I would expect to see some more trash in the puddle. Different manufacturers of, you know, 70S2 with the copper coating on it, depending on where they're made or how tall, you know, how tight their quality assurance program is. You know, you may see more trash in some companies' wires than others. What we're really getting to see right now, this wire is really clean wire. It's got some really good wetting in characteristics and it welds really good. Whenever I terminate my puddle, before I fire back up is I like to take my side cutters and remove that you know that end of the wire so I get a good clean start on my next pass all right we've run one or two passes with the copper coated wire we're gonna run some passes now with the copper free coated wire let's just be clear there's no such thing out there as copper free wire TIG wire has to have the element of copper in it to make it what it is or it cannot be sold in the United States from a welding perspective, what I'm seeing in the puddle right now, there's really no difference in the wire as far as what I'm seeing. No trash, everything's wetting in nice. The biggest issue that a lot of welders have is they're scared to weld hot. And what I always tell welders, if they think they're too hot, turn it up 10 more and just weld faster. Amperage is your friend with TIG welding as long as your travel speed's where it needs to be. Today we're welding with the Aspect 375 Lincoln Power Source. I'm running a 1 8th, 2% thoriated tungsten, and I'm using a number 10 extra long or long jumbo cup, which when you're welding flat really helps get you where you need to be so I'm not choked up on the plate because a TIG rig was originally designed to weld around pipe. So where your hand's not bumping the material itself, you can get away from the base metal. With this cup TIG rig configuration, it allows me to keep my hand, I'm not choked up on the TIG rig, I'm down a way where I can work the cup better and manipulate the puddle where it needs to go. So some of the issues that we see with a lot of welders is they choke up on the TIG rig and then they get in a bind and they're all, they might as well be a contortionist. Be, being a welder and working 10 hour days is about being comfortable, putting yourself in a situation where you can be comfortable when you weld. 
If you're not comfortable when you're making a production weld, you're not going to be thinking about making a good weld. You're going to be thinking about getting yourself out of a situation that you're not comfortable in. So we're going to fire back up now. That tip is free, by the way. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take the coated wire, the copper coated wire, take a piece of our uh, emery cloth. The one thing that I need to be conscious of is normally TIG wire will come marked from the manufacturer is flagged for traceability. This particular wire is ink printed down the length of the wire about every two inches. What I want to make sure I do here is not remove the classification of the wire when I sand this wire because it's not stamped or flagged. I'm going to use a three finger, finger mark, hold the end of the wire so I don't lose that identification off the wire and I'm just going to sand the coating off the wire. The identification is important that we maintain that because when we're up there welding in a pipe rack, if the quality control guy comes running up there and he doesn't see you're welding with wire and he can't tell what it is, he's going to make you cut the weld out. We don't want those problems. Now that I've got my wire clean, we'll compare it. The only difference is, is I've got a little bit rougher surface condition because of the emery cloth, depending on what grit you use. There's a slight difference in the characteristic of the way the wire is wetting into the puddle as it gets consumed by the tungsten arc. Again, I, I, I don't see any visible trash floating in the puddle. But again, there again, we did a really good job prepping the bevel prior to welding. You want to make sure your bevel prep is good, especially with the TIG welding process. We're running about 227 amps on this uh Aspect 375 and I know that sounds really high for pushing a 332 wire But what the audience has to understand is is the travel speed going about three to four inches a minute Heat input or as kilojoules is really relatively pretty low from a welding standpoint or welding characteristic There's not a lot of difference the the weld puddles the the, the way the flow and the fluidity works and everything 99.9% .9 of the welders out there won't be able to tell a difference if we took the tags off the wire and we, sh you know, we handed them three pieces of wire and they welded with it blindfolded, I know you can't do that, but just hypothetically speaking, visually you cannot tell a difference between the welding. It's identical. It all goes back to the quality of the journeyman that's got the TIG rig in his hand and how he can perform that weld. We're gonna come to a close here today. We'd like to thank everybody with uh, WeldTube, and those guys are awesome. If you're interested in having more of these type videos in the future, let us know what you're interested in, and we'll try to attack those subjects as they come up.